The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. The Great Defiance with Dr. David Vivers. Today, I'm delighted to speak with Dr. David Vivas, lecturer in early modern history at Bangor University. David has previously been on PAX to talk about his 2020 book, The Origins of the British Empire in Asia, 1600 to 1750. Today, he's here to discuss his brand new book, which comes out, if I've timed this interview release correctly, today, on the 25th of May, 2023. The book is The Great Defiance, How the World Took on the British Empire, and thanks to David and Penguin, I've been able to get my hands on a review copy. It's really good, and we only scratched the surface in this interview. There's a passage in the book's introduction which I think summarises the perspective which The Great Defiance takes. Dr. Vivas writes, The defining event of the pre-modern world was not the emergence of an all-encompassing British Empire, but the great defiance of the people who found themselves in its path, and their heroic struggle in resisting it often successfully. The English, and then following England's union with Scotland in 1707, the British, were repeatedly frustrated by the power and resilience of the people and places they encountered. So, without further ado, we'll jump right in. Hello David. Hi Sam, thanks for, thanks for inviting me on again to the wonderful podcast, looking forward to it. We'll start off with a fairly straightforward but complicated question. Why did you write The Great Defiance. What was it you were trying to address with this book? You know, there's anyone listening to this that, that might remember my previous uh, appearance. So my, my previous work was uh, focused on, on Asia, the Indian Ocean, the Indian subcontinent, was looking at the expansion of the East India Company across the 17th and 18th century and sort of kind of challenging ideas about expansion as the East India Company's kind of relentless, successful rise at the expense of Asian societies and polities and instead looked at the way in which actually they were quite resilient politically and economically and they often absorbed Europeans and and could often sort of enfranchise Europeans with rights and powers but in a way that strengthened the Mughal Empire or, or the various sultanates of, of South India and that it was a more complicated relationship where the two sort of essentially by the mid 18th century had come to rely on one another and so it's a kind of different kind of an expansion expansion kind of within uh, and because of the power of indian states and uh, sultanates and empires and so i was really interested in in taking or, or following from that research and 
thinking far more widely. Is this going on elsewhere in the pre-modern world? Or are the British, are they just coming in, conquering and running roughshod over everyone and transforming the environments around them, you know, without much opposition? And so in a way, so it's taking that that thread from that early research and, and being quite ambitious and thinking, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it across the world. In the 250 years between the late 16th century through to the end of the um the 18th century and so and and so that's the kind of the main urge from a sort of academic point of view as i was doing my research and my writing i found that that yes absolutely that um you know that that the, the what we really see is the heart of the english and later british empire the atlantic and the north american colonies the caribbean and and places like Ireland is that it is usually just a kind of narrative of, you know, relentless British success and colonisation. But my research was finding otherwise and that actually no, that these a lot of the indigenous political and economic structures proved far more resilient. And that it often took sometimes more than a century for the English to to establish their hegemony and to subvert or to undermine the states and societies that it encountered. So so and I thought, well, this is um this in a way perhaps challenges a very general narratives we have about the British Empire that it came it saw it conquered it refashioned the world in its image Britain made the modern world these are the sort of histories that that still dominate the you know non-specialist public conversation around empire and its legacies as Britain being all conquering and so I thought well this is a great opportunity then to maybe contribute to that conversation and maybe challenge some ideas the wider public might have about uh, you know non-Europeans being sort of very passive inevitable victims of English success and European success and so I uh, when I finished writing the book uh, instead of going down the traditional academic route and, and and writing it for a university press I thought well that's you know I can write this for an audience that maybe have an interest in history but aren't specialists in the British Empire and it'd be a great introduction to an alternative narrative actually the pre-modern world it, it isn't the story of the rise of European empires it's a far more complex story of resistance and 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 as I would say defiance and ensuring that you know what the British Empire ends up as at the end of the 18th century isn't necessarily the success the the, the successful realization of ambitions in London or or Paris or or elsewhere but actually it's more of a compromise between the very powerful and dynamic societies and and empires and and states that the British encountered and British ambition. So there's real compromise. And and so, you know, in many respects, the, the non-Europeans and indigenous people the British encounter shaped the British Empire as much as they were themselves shaped by their encounter with the British. So, And I thought that was a new, fresh take on the British Empire that I thought a wider audience might appreciate. So let's talk about some of these acts of defiance that, that you're referring to. Now, obviously you had to pick and choose with an empire as big and as, as as long lasting as the British, you couldn't cover everything. So what did you choose to focus on? Well, I mean, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is a roughly 250 year period. It's a long period of time. It, it's not a fully comprehensive history of, of uh, British expansion. And, and therefore I had to be selective as, you know, as any historian is in their research and their writing or their, their publishing. And, and I thought, well, I wanted to, in a way, they're very traditional narratives of the British Empire. And when we anchor it from a British perspective, it becomes very sort of um, parochial. You know, it had the struggle with the Spanish and uh, Sir Francis Drake, the establishment of Jamestown and the conquest of Ireland and then the you know opening up of the Indian Ocean and and these sorts of very traditional stories and, and narratives. So I wanted to do some a few things different. I wanted to look at perhaps episodes of resistance that were less known about um, and areas for me also that as a specialist on South Asia that were, were new to me in researching and writing the book. Although I should should say they're not new to historians. A lot of the a lot of the flashpoints that I focus on have been well researched and established by historians, and I think that kind of in bringing them together, um, it and and flipping the perspective we take of the expansion, not from the British perspective, but from the perspective of non-Europeans and indigenous people, it tells an entirely different story. And so, in kind of assembling those flashpoints of resistance and and defiance, which sort of reshaped or even blunted. And sometimes defeated entirely um, British expansion in those particular regions. I wanted to think about the uniqueness and the less well-known stories. And, and so difficult or cha- challenges about writing it from that perspective without the British as your running narrative thread is that you've got a disparate number of 
examples that aren't really tied together so much. Um, and so you have to find a way of linking these stories together in a narrative rather than sort of jumping all over the place with no apparent reason. So um, I began by looking at the areas that we associate with British success, as I said earlier, the Atlantic and those societies and, and states on the Atlantic Rim. Um, and, you know, supposedly this was the heart of the English Empire and the main area of colonisation and conquest. But actually, within the Atlantic, there are surprising stories of indigenous success and endurance and, and resistance, often intergenerational over centuries, which slowed or blunted or contained entirely English ambition. So I thought about um, uh, starting, and, and this is one of the things that, for me, it's a personal bugbear, and I know it is for colleagues in Ireland itself, but Ireland was the first English colony. And yet we often don't begin with Ireland in the history of the British Empire. Sometimes we don't even bring it into the story at all. One of the reasons why is because in the reign of Henry VIII, Ireland is turned into a kingdom of the English monarchy. And so we sort of push it into our domestic history when that may have been the case sort of legally or in terms of sovereignty. But in, you know, practicality on the ground, it's, it's very much a colony. It's treated as a colony and it's a colonial process. And Ireland becomes the kind of laboratory for English strategies of colonialism and atrocity that's then projected elsewhere in the Atlantic. So I thought starting with Ireland would be a great one. You know, Ireland is our nearest neighbour. It's such a long history of violence and, and colonialism and conquest, and it's not one that you see often in curriculums nor even at universities. There's probably a handful of people teaching English colonialism in Ireland in the UK today. I think that was a really interesting one. It's a long history. You know, England was lashing Ireland with Anglo-Norman colonists ever since the 13th, uh, 12th, 13th century. And, and so this was going on for centuries, and um, it all sort of falls apart during... Well, really, the sort of Wars of the Roses, um, when a lot of the English nobles return to England to intervene in the struggle for power and allows the indigenous Irish to recover and to, and to reoccupy most of Ireland that's been over three centuries or so lost to English colonisation. And so they fence the English into what's known as the Pale, which meet the Pale meaning fence. And it's a small kind of strip of territory in the east and so when the Tudors established their dynasty in the mid uh, sorry in the late 16th century they have to try and reconquer Ireland all over again and so I wanted to show that you know English colonialism has a long deep history especially in Ireland and that was really interesting is that we're used to thinking of Ireland as as very early on being kind of subsumed into English rule but um, for most of the subsequent 16th century uh, England really struggles against some of the really powerful Irish lords. And even when they do succeed, and by the end of the century, much of Ireland has been occupied by England, even then, there's a kind of spectacular conflict, the Nine Years' War, under the, the Lord of Ulster, Earl of Tyrone, Hugh O'Neill. And he succeeds in uniting almost all of Ireland against the English and almost succeeds in expelling the English from Ireland entirely. Um, he inflicts the biggest English defeat in Ireland ever, the Battle of the Yellow Four, 2000. English troops are killed. And it's only after almost 10 years of, of conflict that Hugh O'Neill is contained. Only when the English crown commits the full resources of the English state. And it pushes the English state to the brink of collapse. And one of the great things about little known facts that if we think the way we treat the late 16th century, the Elizabethan period, is Spain and the intervention in the Netherlands, um, you know, the Armada and all of that take kind of prime position. And, it, and Ireland is a colonial sideshow. But actually, in terms of military expenditure and manpower, Ireland absorbs more than both the war with Spain and intervention in the Netherlands combined. So it's not a sideshow. Side it's the main theatre of uh, military conflict at the end of the period, some two million pounds are spent trying to crush the Irish lords and maybe over 100,000 English are killed in the process. So that was a, you know, it's such an important part of our history and in, as a starting point for the English Empire, the early modern empire. And yet, yeah, so little known. So that was that was a really exciting flashpoint to start with to show just how kind of resilient. And even after the Irish lords lose their political independence, Irish culture, Irish law, Irish society... And, and and the Catholic religion survive and go on. And the English never really succeed in colonising Irish society in the way they do territory. And, uh, you know, we, the subsequent centuries are a history of resistance and rebellion all the way up to the, the early 20th century when Ireland 
achieves its independence. So, yeah, that was a really interesting story. And then I filter out from there looking at the unsuccessful colonisation of Ossimacomac, which we know as maybe the Carolina Sounds region in North America, uh, the establishment of the colony of Roanoke, which is a really interesting early earliest attempt at the English to establish colonies in North America across the Atlantic. But it's it's one of complete failure. There are multiple attempts to sustain a colony, but due to fierce um, resistance from the Algonquin people, um, Seneca Moco is a kind of divided region between different indigenous people, but gradually they're able to contain the English. Only after many of the people of Seneca Moco are killed through disease and through violence committed by the English. But eventually Sir Walter Raleigh, who's funding these expeditions, gives up. It's costing too much and, and they withdraw for a good almost century, don't return back. So the failure of Roanoke, and historians sometimes obsessed with Roanoke because of the lost colony. There's a story that uh, they had to withdraw and leave a, over 100 colonists there and they were never seen again and what happened to them. But yeah, that misses the point for me. That's a really uh, powerful story about indigenous Americans who are often reduced to yeah being these kind of passive victims of European disease and violence and, and kind of being wiped out. And But actually, no, they've, you know, Seneca Mexico is a bustling indigenous country powerful they've got good knowledge of europeans and what they're up to and they use that against the colonists and um, it's a good example how they are able to succeed against english ambition and so um and then i look at jamestown and we think of jamestown as the first successful english colony in north america from 1607 Um, but actually i show how it takes almost a half a century for the english colonists to contest the power the powhatan chieftain which is the main political military power in what we call Virginia, but was known as um, Seneca Moco. And, and that there's three Anglo Powhatan Wars and you know it's it, it's it's a real a really contested space. It's not a case of the colonists coming in and and, and overthrowing Powhatan hegemony in, and they retain that hegemony all the way through to the sixteen forties when finally the chieftain is is dismantled and the Powhatan people have been decimated by war and disease and displacement. And then finally, in that first part of the book, I then look at uh, the Caribbean. And that for me was was maybe one of the most rewarding parts of the book. I spent a couple of chapters talking about the indigenous Kalanago people, for which I'll confess before writing the book, I knew a little bit, but not much. And we think of the Caribbean as the kind of the beating heart of the English mercantilist empire, the plantation society based on sugar, cotton and tobacco as fueling the maritime power of England and, you know, contributing to its great power status by the end of the 17th century. And if we think about Caribbean resistance, we think about European rivalry, you know, control for the Caribbean sugar islands between the English and the French or the Dutch or or the Spanish and Portuguese. But actually, the indigenous Kalinago people um, resist every square inch of territory which the English attempt to colonise in the Caribbean. And there's a really exciting story there of the Kalinago uh, managing to contain English colonisation to the far north of the Eastern Caribbean. The English are focused on the Lesser Antilles, places like St. Kitts and Antigua and those sorts of islands. But that's the Kalinago heartland. And the Kalinago are a really mobile people. They use canoes as big as entire trees that could fit 40 people in. And their canoe war fleets were a power to be reckoned with. And they were able to to, to kind of really blunt English colonisation, despite English attempts to use, you know, really mass violence. There's hideous massacres, sometimes of 2000, a very infamous one in 1626 on the island of St. Christopher, La Amiga, as the Kalanago called it. And English conquest is consolidated through the massacre of over 2000 Kalanago people. So violence, colonial violence is at the forefront of the conquest. But despite that, uh, through counter raids and, and by dominating at sea, the Kalanag are able to maintain the English and to the, hem them into the north for uh, almost 40 years. It's not really until the 1660s, some 40 years after the first English colony is established on St. Kitts, where the English are finally able to take over large portions of the Eastern Caribbean. But there's a remarkable treaty between the Kalinago and the French and English, which is really a kind of concession by the Europeans of the power of the Kalinago people, where they're forced to partition the rest of the islands with the Kalinago. So there's a, a Kalinago independent territory in the late 17th century, which which the English and French have conceded to respect and, and not to not to conquer. So it's a great example of even in the heart of the emerging English empire, indigenous people were able to to reshape English ambitions and to often successfully contest imperial expansion. I asked David about what he calls the European gaze, 
how English and other European contemporaries viewed non-European societies, and especially their militaries. Yeah, I think that was, for me, one of the most surprising things. I see that in when I study the uh, the East India Company in Asia. <clears throat> you know, Asia is the centre of the world in the pre-modern period. It's got the world's uh, early modern superpowers, the Mughal Empire, uh, you know, Safavid Persia, Tokugawa Japan. And, and the English are operating from a place of intense weakness and vulnerability. And the very few occasions they challenge the military might of the Mughal Empire, for example, they're essentially swatted aside and have to go back begging for forgiveness. And, and so I was curious about that sort of military technological uh, kind of benefit that the English sources suggest that they had and and their rendering of indigenous people uh, as savages, of course, is the language most frequently used in the sources as barbarians. And you know, there's a fantastic East India Company source for the 1640s or 50s discussing the Indians of India and sort of saying these aren't like the savages, savage Indians in America. And so there's this you know, othering that happens in the Atlantic, which doesn't really come into play in Asia until the later 18th and 19th centuries when Britain is uh, aspiring to imperial dominance. And so uh, what was interesting is, yes, the sources do often dismiss the the power and the dynamism and the and the resilience of indigenous people in the Atlantic. And I think the Kalinago are a great example, uh, one of which is that, you know, they, they don't call them the Kalinago. That's Kalinago is the term they identify themselves by. Europeans and the English call them Caribs um, and uh, dismiss them as cannibals. And they're doing this largely from Spanish sources. The Caribs were the people that uh, uh, Columbus and his successors could not conquer. There's a, almost a century of Spanish attempts to dominate the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, sorry, the Eastern Caribbean. But the Kalinago successfully, after about a century, fight off the Spanish and in fact take the war to the Spanish and raid the Spanish mainland and the Greater Antilles where the Spanish colonies are. So uh, over this century of struggle, the Kalinago have developed a really sophisticated military and defensive system that's very responsive to external aggression and so they've sort of perfected this and so when the english come in with their you know spanish stereotypes of the indigenous people as being cannibals and savages actually what it is is that they're playing into spanish tropes about for, you know from a place of failure and frustration at the sophistication of the Kalinago people and their ability to defeat the spanish and and i think that really puts the english on the back foot because you know actually as they encounter the Kalinago, they realize that these are not people that you should be messing with and what i think the great way in which the Kalinago are able to sort of subvert those english stereotypes about Kalinago society is that they often dismiss for example the the chiefs as these small village tribal chiefs and and actually the chiefs are these are elected uh, uh, um, officers and uh, they're responsible for foreign policy and for defence. And they're usually people that have been elected by the, the, the various villages and towns because of their, um, their their reputation and their abilities. And, and they're able to create inter-island um, um, or intercommunal um, alliances that bring several communities across the various islands together to uh, confront aggressors. And so the English often thought that the islands were totally divided and that they would you know land on one island and and think they were dealing with the chief of this particular part of the island but what that uh what the chief would often do is then secretly um uh, call for support from uh, neighboring islands and and the um the chiefs there and suddenly very unawares the english would be confronted with quite a strong coalition um that would um that would strike and contain them very early on and so they they realized that they they lacked the military advantage that they had that they had hoped and one of the a great example of this is uh, there's an english shipwreck on 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 one of the islands uh saint lucia and saint lucia is in the heartland of the calinago territory and there's about 120 or so colonists and um and they know they shouldn't be here they know that the calinago are you know they're very hospitable they are very friendly but if you outstay your welcome if you show any signs of attempting to settle uh then they you know they quite rightly uh um, confront the colonists and and attempt to expel them and so um after uh several weeks they the english have a plan to 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 actually um try and settle in saint lucia the castaways and um and and before you know it within a week or so there's an inter kind of uh, communal inter-island coalition that lands and um the english are confident in the cannon that they have um managed to assemble and 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 their armor and their and their guns obviously 
Um, but the Kalanaga use uh, poisonous arrows um, from the saps of a, a particular plant and, and they're able to apply cotton to the end and set them alight and they create an inferno in the English camp and, um, and uh, uh, very quickly... Many of the English are sort of going insane from the effects of the poison. The cant is an inferno. The camps are flame. It's an inferno. And you, and, and as everyone's dying around them, um, the Kalanago are barely able to be seen, hidden from uh, from the shoreline. Um, and for almost five straight days, there's uh, maybe a, a dozen or two dozen English um, who are clinging on to this cannon. It's run out of ammunition, so they're loading it with, with pebbles and stones and shooting at anything that comes past. And they're clinging on, but they're dying of the exposure. They're there for almost five days. Um, the whole camp has been decimated. Everyone else has died. And they're swiveling the cannon this way and that way as the Kalanago essentially just hem them in. And so, uh, and eventually they surrender and the Kalanago um, put them into a boat and uh, set them adrift. And, and and so it's a great subversion of you can land and have ships and cannon, but essentially this is Kalanago territory and, and their relationship with the, you know, the environment, their ability to use poison and, and to use cotton, which they trade with Europeans and actually use it to, as a kind of fire projectile. Um, it's a great example of that, but no, you mentioned that the, the canoe fleets and, and there is a sort of dismissal, but it's, interesting if you read the sources carefully that yes there are those typical european othering of the kalanago and indigenous americans and and so forth but sometimes they just can't help but be but marvel at what they're encountering in the in the atlantic and you see that with the kalanago um you can read through the source and you know they are their accounts especially by french missionaries who are completely you know how are they building these you know these 30 foot canoes that are aren't just for war they're for trade and you know the the we think about the trade winds as dictating movement in the atlantic but the trade winds are not important in the caribbean it's the local currents and kalanago knowledge of currents mean that they've carved out these maritime highways where they can travel around the caribbean in hours and uh, most days um and so whereas the Europeans big ships are at the mercy of the trade winds and that mobility um, allows them to trade widely and to move widely. Some islands are not settled permanently. They're used to grow certain crops, which the uh, uh, Kalanago travel around and, and utilize for part of the year. And then they'll move on to another island. And so they've created this amazing maritime um, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, sort of um, ecosystem for trade but also for, for war. And so these are uh, these these canoes. Sometimes it takes a whole year to carve these and to make them into the um, into the, the ships they are. But and you see that most spectacularly when the Kalanago, we often hear about, you know, the British dividing and conquering um, across the world. But the Kalanago are really adept at turning the Europeans against one another and, and dividing the European presence and and exploiting it so the Kalanago um seeing the French as the lesser um challenge to their um their dominion they they ally with the French by 1660 against the English and you have this spectacular when war breaks out in uh, the early 1660s the French navy uh, is fighting side by side with the Kalanago a uh, war fleet of about 80 canoes and 1500 people and they and they uh, and, and maritime battles take place between the royal navy and the french kalanago fleets and so they're fighting as equals and and the english in what comes through the sources the english are more terrified of the kalanago fleets than they are of the french navy because they're more mobile and they're able to they're expert raiders and they're able to kind of hit an island and you know, get out of there before any kind of response can be can can materialize, and and so you get these great sources where you know they say it's not the French we're scared of; it's the the well they call them heathens, the Kalanago in their fleets um, of canoes. So, so yeah, so that that you know they fall into these mistakes of perpetrating these uh, these old Spanish uh, stereotypes that come from a place of fear and weakness because the Kalanago have defeated the Spanish and they go in and. And so that any idea of kind of superiority, the Kalanago are very good at subverting that and using it to their own advantage. And, um, and I think you see that time and again in these, the, the, the way in which the Kalanago are really the third power in the Eastern Caribbean. It's the French, the English, and then it's the Kalanago. And, uh, you know, their political and military power survives all the way into the 18th century. Hello, Saver. 
Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realise the historical significance of the woman behind the name, or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. And just to finish the, the story of the Kalinago, you mentioned that they, they come to a treaty with the French and the English and have a, have a, have a territory, and notice you said territory and not state. How was how was the issue of acknowledgement in that treaty dealt with by the by the English and, and the French and, and what happened to that to that territory? Yeah, it's uh, it's a good question because it's really pertinent to to the story. Um, the book focuses on these flashpoints of defiance and the success, but ultimately, you know, we know in the by the end of the 18th century, the turn of the 19th century, we know the British Empire becomes dominant and successful and one of the foremost imperial powers. And, and so that I tried not to write this from a kind of um, uh, from a place of that inevitability. I wanted to look at these flashpoints, you know, these flashpoints on their own terms. And But yeah, ultimately, the 1660 Treaty is, is such a fascinating document. You rarely see the Europe, great European powers enter into treaties which treat indigenous people in terms of their equality. And so we look at this kind of, uh, the sources at the time often called, you know, referred to it as this sort of reserve. And But it's not. It's an independent Kalinago territory. And um, it's something that, um, it, 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 it's interesting because the, because you're right in not identifying, there's no Kalinago state. We often try and project those kind of European ideas of the state onto indigenous polities and uh, the Powhatan chiefdom is a is a chiefdom it's a kind of complex network of communities that are tied together through kinship and through um through tributary status we often think of it as an empire or or a kingdom but it but it wasn't those things so we have to understand indigenous political structures on their own terms so when Europeans did they often then dismiss them as quite simple um but but they're very effective and and the Kalinago operate communally so um you know in terms of the local level um each village or community you know shared shared the land and and there was no no um private property and and so it looked pretty utopian it wasn't there were important gender inequalities um um women did most of the domestic work and um they also did a lot of the economic work and they produced manufacturers for trade and they tended to um to to crops and and to commodities that would then be traded men tended to focus on war and a significant amount of their time was spent on recreation and so you've got a great french uh, missionary accounts of the 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 men essentially lazing around playing the flute daydreaming um painting themselves in in red dye the French missionaries were scandalised. These lazy people, you know, they're coming from a very European capitalist system in which everyone pays taxes and labour is the kind of driving force in a society. And they fail to recognise this, you know, the way, you know, this is the dream, surely, the, you know, the way society should be. But, you know, that's a too rosy a picture. As I say, um, it's a very, you know, gender, there's a lot of gender inequality and an unfair 
share of labor but so these are these are communities very decentered they elect chiefs that oversee uh war and foreign policy but there's not much hierarchy uh there are family heads that often um uh govern several households together um but yeah and so the the communities operate very loosely and autonomously from one another but were often able to come together so impressively in such a short amount of time and that's something that they had developed over a century was between fighting the spanish and were able to to deploy against the english so um the way in which the english and the french have to go about um uh, creating this treaty is by calling together all of the various chiefs of the various islands so in the end something got 11 turn up on guadeloupe to uh, agree to the treaty and we've got a list of of the 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 chiefs who were involved which is very rare again to have the names of of uh, indigenous leaders especially in, in the caribbean and so that's a really great document and as i said the terms are ones of equality um so it brings an end to the to the 40 year war between the Kalinago islands and the french and the english the french and the english promise to return Kalinago captives and they promise not to settle in Kalinago islands as identified by the treaty for the Kalinago, they promise no longer to raid french and english islands but uh, significantly there's no limits on where they can settle so their independent territory is respected but they're still free to settle beyond their own territory on various european islands and what's interesting for me is that in some of those islands that we accept as being French or English by this time, still have significant Kalinago populations and communities on them. And so most islands tended to be unofficially partitioned. So Guadeloupe is a great example. It's the, the key in, uh, French colony in the Caribbean. And yet, even by the end of the century, it's still partitioned. The, the windward side, the kind of right or eastern side, is uh, settled by the Kalinago and the French are contained to the the uh, leeward side or the the western portion so they're even outside of their homeland there's quite significant uh Kalinago communities elsewhere but um essentially that in in some ways that loose autonomy was uh, the kind of downfall of the power of the Kalinago. um they could come together uh in terms in, in times of extreme kind of um uh, challenges to dispel the english or fight the french or spanish but um there was no significant inter island uh, organization or unity in a way that they could come together on a kind of more permanent basis and so uh, what that means is that after 1660 um, there are there are four more wars with the Kalinago across the next 150 years and um, and in each war often the Kalinago are divided and um, even on the same island so um, the island of uh, Dominica for example or Huayta Kabuli as it was known to the Kalinago, um, the Kalinago divided between uh, pro pro French communities on the windward side, and we can loosely term them pro English uh, communities on 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 the the leeward. And so the English ally with the leeward communities against the the French backed windward communities, and 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 through that the English were able to to bring Dominica under some kind of impermanent and loose control and so uh, this way they gradually chip away at Kalinago independence um because it, you know there's no single unified Kalinago polity um but even then in two further wars in the 17th century essentially contain the Kalinago to just two or three key islands saint lucia dominica and, and a couple of smaller islands uh, and, and this is the kind of point really by the 16 uh so 1676 onwards is where we can essentially suggest that the english and french are hegemonic in in the lesser antilles in the eastern caribbean but even then it takes two further quite spectacular wars in the later 18th century known as the anglo carib wars for finally for um the kalinago to be uh kind of completely expelled from the caribbean um so at the end of the uh the fourth war in the 1790s the remaining 5000 kalinago people of the eastern caribbean are deported by the british colonial authorities and sent to live uh, on an island off the coast of honduras um they're not the kalinago present presence kind of clings on in you know small enclaves and hidden kind of valleys and uh, and things but essentially from from that point onwards it is but you know that's a so that's a process 175 years in the making it's to to kind of write the indigenous people off early on when sugar begins to spread and and the english colonization increases is is to tell a very small part of the story we have to acknowledge that this was a long process it rarely went how the english wanted it to go and even at the very 
height of their power in the 18th century, they're still having to compromise for control of the Caribbean. So, so, so it's a very drawn out um, affair. And so, when I argue in this book, you know, we, <laughs> okay, this is maybe in some terms the age of empire when the European empires are expanding and dominating the world, but that is, you know, a three century period in which they're. Their expansion is contested by this constellation of very powerful polities that that often you don't, you know, very hard outside, you know, specialist academic research to find the story of the Kalinago people in narratives of the British Empire. They're almost ignored. Uh, and, and so, you know, these are the kind of small stories I wanted to bring to a wider audience and share some of the fantastic research that my colleagues working in these kind of areas uh, are doing that you know, a, a non-specialist a member of the public might not have access to or, or, or would know about. That what they're particularly good at doing, I think, which makes the story even more relevant, is the fact that, um, yes, their numbers are decimated and uh, they're reduced through enslavement, uh, through war and violence and colonisation and displacement. But actually, they're, they're pretty good at, at, at sort of avoiding demographic collapse by absorbing other communities and so a really uh, important community obviously a growing one in the 17th century is those of enslaved african people who are brought over in their hundreds and thousands in the later 17th century to work on sugar plantations um is that many of them run away and these we refer to them as maroon communities of runaway enslaved people they find refuge and shelter amongst the kalanago and so we have this kind of the Kalinago numbers becoming decimated, but but rebounding slightly as they absorb runaway enslaved people. And so the more runaway slaves there are, the kind of and so so there are, you know, maybe in the 1670s, maybe a, a military strength of 1500 Kalinago uh, uh, people and and possibly about 40 percent of those are. Uh, are maroons are runaway enslaved people who who are intermarry or intermingle um and you know integrate into Kalinago society or some of them set up autonomous communities you know that ally with the Kalinago so that's just another example of the way they're able to you know use the kind of in you know, slavery and plantation society against the English and in the Kalinago raids where they attack English colonies and islands they the part of that is to you know uh, um, uh, acquire loot and and capture the English, but one of the other things they do is they they liberate enslaved people, um, a considerable number who are integrated into Kalanago society. So, so for me, you know, ignoring this story is ignoring a big piece of the puzzle of understanding about English colonialism in places like the Caribbean. And again, to talk about the, just the way that the Europeans viewed the, the 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 cultures they were engaging with. One of the things I really enjoy about the way you write the Great Defiance is you're very clear where the contemporaries, especially the contemporary English, are probably misunderstanding their situation. There's a fantastic bit where you talk about, but John Smith is, is taken captive and he's paraded around the Powhatan territories and shown off to all these communities. And he's seeing this as a grand tour of, I don't know, respect or or something like that. And you point out that, no, it's 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 much akin to a victory parade. Look at these these strange foreigners who have rocked upon our shores and are causing a problem. We can be, we can beat them. And yet he reports back that oh yes, I was shown all these honors and feasted and stuff. And it's like no, this is a triumph. You're a prisoner in a triumph. That's just a really good example of the fact that there's a longer history here before the English arrive. And so yeah, you know, one of the things when you shed light on English colonialism, especially violence and and slavery the often the response especially from people perhaps who aren't specialists is you know but yeah but you know it wasn't just the english it was the, the spanish and the portuguese and the french and the dutch and and, and that's absolutely true of, of course um i don't think that <laughs> does anything to change the fact that the english are doing it but it, it is true that the english are, are coming in often often on the kind of um coattails of other europeans and so by the time the english arrive in places like japan as well um which they attracted to through portuguese and dutch accounts but especially in north america where they're really relying on you know portuguese maps and portuguese and spanish written accounts which are published in europe that they go in with a it's very i guess eurocentric very kind of um, um very sort of othered view of these people and um and, and there's a particular emphasis on yeah I, i've mentioned sort of the european gaze but you could also call it whiteness of course and is that they they there's a great account you know from Osamacomac, south south carolina well the carolinas i guess 
what you would call it, um, is that when they try and uh, establish the Roanoke colonies, uh, this chap, Arthur Barlow, was writing that, you know, the indigenous people were seemed to be amazed by my skin and by the, our European appearance and all of this sort of thing. And he's writing. and uh, But actually, <laughs> what, what he doesn't realise is that they're not amazed um is that they've got a long history with dealing with europeans and um the english feel like you know they are this kind of unique race and that the indigenous people are are kind of um in awe but actually uh, before the english arrive in the 1580s they've been dealing with french and, and spanish and portuguese trade and colonists and um they have successfully expelled european colonies before and some algonquin indigenous algonquin people have been to europe and have come back and so know quite a lot about european society um and and you know and and, and therefore they they know what to expect and 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 two um two uh, algonquins go back with one of these fleets uh funded by sir walter Raleigh, and they go go back to england they're dispatched um by the chief of roanoke and he wants to understand a, a bit about these people who he's kind of let in you know he wants to trade with them they bring metal goods and and things like that and so there could be an an advantage there could be a benefit to, to him and he sends uh, uh these two algonquin people back and they come back and one of them is very kind of um glamoured by england and thinks it's marvelous and that the future of the roanoke people should be to ally with these powerful people with their stone cities with many thousands and the other one is completely um uh, completely aghast and 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 realizes that you know the english uh, they're people to be feared and and you know that that Roanoke will be swallowed up if they don't defend themselves and so there is a there's a great articulation amongst the Algonquin people about who these Europeans are and it's less from a place of my gosh you know look at them and more from a place of sizing them up and and generally getting getting a good kind of idea about who they are and what they want and so very quickly um do the Algonquin rulers in Seneca Mico sort of turn on the English and realizing that if they don't oppose them or resist them then there's trouble trouble ahead and the same you know you got a great example of um of uh, John Smith in Virginia, or what would be called um, uh, Seneca Moco. Um, yeah, he's paraded, he's captured um, by uh, Opa Chankano, who's the brother of Wahoon Sanako, the paramount chief. And he orders him to go out and find this John Smith. They've recently landed John Smith as leading expeditions up the James River to reconnoitre the area. Is this a suitable colony for the English? And Wahoon Sanaka wants him contained and wants him under control. So he sends his brother out who captures him. Yes, and part of Algonquin, you know, cultural norms are about respect and about hospitality, um, mostly about exchange of gift giving. And so they treat John Smith very well and they feast him and host him. Someone tries to assassinate him, the father of uh, one of the Powhatan warriors who John Smith manages to shoot as he's being attacked. But um, other than that, it's a pleasant experience for uh, John Smith but absolutely this is a way you know he doesn't realize he'd been taken 20 25 miles around the chieftain paraded because the Powhatans know who these Europeans are and they want to prove as you said um that they that the Powhatans are more than a match for them and so um it reassures many of the tribes the Powhatan a paramount chiefdom is a kind of loose, sort of slemmy loose affiliation brought under the rule of Wahoon Sanaka and the tribes furthest away from Wahoon Sanaka's seat of power are more autonomous and uh, and therefore it's a way to strengthen the bonds of the various tribes um and John Smith <laughs> unwittingly plays that part brilliantly and so I think that underestimation but, it, but that's not unique to the Atlantic the English take that out to uh to Asia as well um and you know places like japan for example where they arrive in japan um 1611 um, yeah 1611 really much of what they know about japan comes from portuguese uh and dutch accounts that that show this country that's embroiled in 150 years of you know the sengoku period of the warring uh daimyo and the warring japanese lords um and it's a very politically fractured and turbulent and you know that's great news for Europeans who, who the Portuguese especially have been, been able to use that turbulence and insert themselves into Japanese trading systems and and have established themselves in Kyushu and the southernmost island of Japan spread their religion there's something like 300,000 Catholic converts 
and and have able to gain a kind of semi monopoly on the trade routes between Japan and China and and the Portuguese have made themselves very dominant in southern Japan and very wealthy. So the English come in uh, with these kind of very misguided ideas about the society and the political environment that they're entering. And, and that lack of knowledge uh, or certainly less relevant knowledge now that possibly, you know, that's not a good description of Japan ever. But that made some sense 20 years ago. But by the time the English arrive in Japan in 1611, there's a new uh, shogun, Shogun Ayusa. Uh, his Tokugawa shogunate has centralised power. Um, he's created a strong, expansive bureaucracy. The kind of state that makes the bureaucracy and states in Europe at the time look amateur. You know, Whitehall had something like 1,200 kind of part-time slightly kind of amateurish officials the the bakufu the military government of japan under the tokugawa shoguns has extensive hundreds of thousands of officials running state departments that regulate trade religion uh everything foreign relations and the spectacular centralization of power upon the shogun himself the english just don't understand where power lies they still think it lies with the independent daimyos who have kind of taken over parts of japan and run it like their private fiefdoms that's not the case anymore that the shogun has has reduced the the daimyos more like to kind of like to be dependent upon the court in in edu and, and so power and trade has shifted away from the provinces and centred on the court of the shogun. And the English just don't know this. And they, they spend 15 years messing around in Haradu, which is basically a fishing hamlet, 700 miles away from the centre of power, which you need access to. Uh, under the new shoguns, to trade in Japan and succeed, you have to participate in what's known as the Red Seal system, where you have to gain a, a licence from the from, from the shogun that's stamped with his Red Seal stamp, his seal of a authority and only then can you officially participate in trade and it takes them years to figure this out and they waste all of their money and, and time messing around on the fringes of japan until they finally learn you need political capital access to court a relationship with the shogun understand the very complex bakufu bureaucracy and by the time they they, they figure this out they're, they're they're far behind the other europeans and um and so they're always on the back foot because of it and and so and, and ultimately they fail in Japan, um, mostly because Japan itself turns against the Europeans. It seems their presence is very corrosive and uh, undermines Japanese sovereignty. And gradually all the Europeans are expelled except the Dutch. But um, uh, and, and so that could be very costly. And, you know, if you look at a map of the British Empire at the end of the 18th century, you think, wow, how successful. But, you know, if you look at East Asia, which was an intense focus of the East India Company earlier on, there's no imperial pink, uh, not because the English weren't interested, because they failed miserably. China, Japan, Southeast Asia are all shut to the English through their their failures and their mistakes um, and the power of the the societies and the states that they encounter there. And so but in some areas, they, they gradually learn from those mistakes and they gradually are able to tap themselves into local systems of knowledge and trade. And, and that's a several you know process takes several decades and. But in places like India, they do eventually manage to to master that, and they become an important cog in the wider circuits of trade and and knowledge and and an exchange. And so, yes, that that could often be fatal, as in North America. Uh, it could often lead to big disappointment, as in East Asia. And sometimes they're eventually able to get their act together and learn from their kind of fa fatal misunderstandings of the non-European people they encounter. The Great Defiance only goes up to a certain point, but I think your argument that the British Empire is just a lot of the time fitting to the spaces and the crags it can get hold of and growing from there, that seems to play out for me. I mean, obviously, my, my focus, my specialism is 20th century and, and the British Empire by the First World War is just a hodgepodge made out of necessity and there's no there's no idea of overall a uniform style of, of imperial expansion. It's just it makes perfect sense that that didn't come out of nothing that is the way it's always been almost yeah and i think that talks mostly to the fact that not necessarily that the british were not concerned with creating some kind of unity some kind of overarching governance and i think they were and i i think they spent a lot of time and there's some great historians that have written about this attempt to impose some kind of order which itself is a kind of colonial project and justification for empire i think in fact it speaks far more to the fact that it's the local context that the British were operating in that deter generally determined the outcome of their presence there. And I think it's the, the resilience and strength of the non-European indigenous people they met meant that 
whether they were successful and how successful and how dominant they were really depended on on those particular flashpoints of resistance and how the English and later the British were able to overcome them. So I think you're you're absolutely right. We've got this kind of patchwork, this kind of um, Hobbesian nightmare of this <laughs> slightly um, kind of cranky structure that is different you know in you know british rule in india is is very different to uh you know colonies in in north america and i think that's because it's those local encounters and um and the different people and the different states and cultures that the english and british encounter it's they're the determining factor that that's the overriding force which shapes british expansion and so in a way we've kind of forgotten that you know it's not centrifugal the british empire there are certain times when it can be centrifugal, when the forces emanating from Europe and from Britain and London can have a decisive impact or intervention in certain regions of the world. That that can happen. You know, there are obvious examples of that happening. But I think generally the patterns of the development, the way the British Empire develops and expands and retreats and the shapes it takes and um, the local power structures are essentially determined by the the people it encounters they have an agency over the expansion of the british empire in a way that i think we don't always accept and that's not obviously to make the silly argument they are partners in empire i think that's that suggests collaboration and while obviously we know local elites did often to quite a quite a big extent collaborate with british imperialism colonialism especially places in india um actually i think what we're talking about is really the the, the power of indigenous and non-european people over the british and the fact that the british had to constantly accommodate uh, their interests and and their power and so it wasn't a case of coming in and flattening indigenous and non-european states and societies and refashioning them and controlling them what the british end up ruling is yeah this compromise between indigenous and non-european power and what the british actually wanted and so had they had their way, you know, then they would have been in China and Japan and um, they would have dominated the Indonesia and the Spice Islands. And they wouldn't it wouldn't have taken them 150 years to colonize all of the Caribbean and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that, yes, you're absolutely right. It's this kind of ramshackle uh, patchwork. It's very different depending on uh, where you are. And I think that tells us a lot about, you know, this kind of sh the sheet of steel that is the British Empire has been kind of hammered, hammered and and indigenous power has left this kind of far more ragged contours, these kind of, you know, like you said, crevices and niches. And that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at necessarily the success of the British when we look at a map of the empire. We're looking at its kind of often fatal compromises uh, and the survival of indigenous and non-European people and, and often if not their political independence then certainly their cultural and social power and so so yeah so we're not necessarily always thinking i think about it in the right way let me recommend another history podcast on the airwave network history uncovered is a conversation podcast from kalina fraga and austin harvey staff writers from all that's interesting.com History Uncovered has more than 100 episodes on everything historical, from disasters to unsolved true crime mysteries to folklore and the paranormal. Kalina and Austin also have a monthly History Happy Hour, which is a really interesting look at new discoveries from the world of academic history and archaeology. Explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world's past by listening to History Uncovered wherever you get your podcasts. Let me recommend another history podcast on the Airwave Network. The Explorers Podcast. Friend of the show Matt Breen takes you into jungles and frigid wastelands, across deserts and oceans, as he covers the life and times of history's greatest explorers. Alongside Magellan, Drake, Lewis and or Clark, he also covers lesser known figures. I've particularly enjoyed his recent series on Freya Stark, someone I'd never heard of, but whose life is fascinating. Her story combines her life as a woman during the early 20th century, European empire building in the Middle East in the aftermath of the First World War, and the legacy of the medieval assassins, the scourge of Saladin, crusading kings, and the Mongols. Each explorer Matt covers gets as much time as their story needs. Sometimes this means it's a one-off episode, other times it's hours of engaging narrative. Find The Explorers Podcast wherever you get your podcasts or go to explorerspodcast.com to find out more.
when we last talked on the podcast back in uh, 2021, we were talking about this book that you were working on at the time. And at the time, your working title was The Mirage of Empire, A New History of the World at the Dawn of British Expansion. Now, obviously, titles change for all sorts of reasons, but I'm curious, does the change in title, from, from The Mirage of Empire to The Great Defiance, does that reflect a change in focus for the book, or did changing the title lead to a different book hitting the shelves? Or, uh, another way, is The Great Defiance the same book you thought The Mirage of Empire was going to be, and if not, what's different? Oh, that's such a good question. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Yes, I think the research and the writing of the book changed what the book ended up being and I think all good research and writing should do that um you have an idea of where you're going obviously you have an, a hypothesis and I you know I I pitched the book to Penguin and, and sold the book to Penguin on this the mirage of empires this idea that you know we can't it's difficult to understand what the the states and societies were like in the pre-modern world because a lot of the history that's come down to us have been distorted by this kind of the, you know the pen of the colonizer and and the histories the kind of 20th century histories that the often british colonialists and imperialists and officials had actually written about the places that they were ruling or governing and so i i wanted to write a history that kind of that had to kind of get through this mirage this kind of this kind of propagandistic imperial veil that covered these histories and and obviously they had a interest in in dismissing the power of indigenous and non-european societies part of the colonial process is in about obviously reducing those people to to you know to to othering them to to being you know backward or violent or cruel and somehow justifying white imperial rule uh you know the white man's burden as as kipling said in the later 19th century and so that process leads to a body of scholarship that you know we see that influence all the way down to the 20th early 21st century you know books like uh i'll pick a fight here Niall ferguson's you know how britain made the world and it's just this idea that that's such a colonial you know regurgitation of victorian imperial histories of the places that britain was occupying and so i wanted to kind of pull that and show that these were actually successful just this they're ultimately 300 years later conquered or colonized but in their on their own terms at the time they're examples of very successful sophisticated dynamic powerful cultures economies and in, uh, and political structures and that we shouldn't dismiss them as passive victims of english or british success and and that was the book i um i kind of thought about so looking at the ways in which yeah focusing more about the stories and the histories of these places and and, and so that that element has obviously stayed an important part of the book but when i was started researching it back when we spoke uh, it became less about that mirage, although it still is about that, the way that it's clouded the actual view of these places and people and their history. It became more antagonistic because the sources were just, you know, in a way I was coming from studying the British in Asia, in which they have to accommodate to their surroundings because the the East India Company is, is weak. Um, most of the Europeans are. And, you know, they're, work, they're operating amongst, as I said earlier, the pre-modern world superpowers, the Mughal Empire, you know, ruled... 125 million people, 20% of the world's GDP. You know, it's the centre of cultural and you know, scientific and uh, uh, of learning and knowledge, and um, and and, and so it, 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 violence was obviously part of the equation. You know, the English often tried to get what they wanted through violence, but when that failed, and and it almost always did, they had to then reconcile and find a way to adapt and play play by the rules that were written by non-Europeans. And so, but as I was getting in, widening this, as I said at the beginning of this talk, taking that idea and of the power of non-European people and looking at the Atlantic and I look at the Mediterranean, I look at West Africa, it became a far more antagonistic story. There's just more violence and there's more resistance. You know, we could cast the relationship between the British and the Mughal Empire as one of resistance in a way, but the Mughal Empire were operating on a position of power and strength. So it's not so much resistance as it is, you know, is swatting the English away and saying, don't be silly. And the English coming back on, on their hands and knees. But it, it is more uh, uh, how we would describe resistance between if you take somewhere like the Caribbean or even, you know, Virginia, um, Seneca Moco, there's 15,000 people in the Bauhattan chiefdom. By the end of the 17th century, there's maybe a quarter of a million 
uh, European colonists living on the eastern seaboard. 40,000 colonists crammed into the Caribbean islands. And you know by the end of the 17th, early 18th century, there's maybe 5,000 Kalanago people. So this tsunami of both forced and, and free migration and labour does to an extent yeah lead to what we would term resistance um and so that uh, so the story became more antagonistic it became more uh, and i saw also about you know i <clears throat> obviously study Mughal history uh the british empire in asia but you know and this book placing it into that more global context and and making the story across a much longer period and um the way in which the Mughal empire itself dissolves through not necessarily through the British ex- uh, Britain's expansion, but more because the Marathas, the this, uh, um, Hindu empire in central uh, India in the Deccan, uh, usurps and eventually gobbles up the Mughal Empire, and it's the really the Marathas who take on the British at the end of the 18th century for for hegemony over the Indian subcontinent, and that became a story again of defiance and resistance. And so, researching and 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 writing the book did change it less of a kind of excavation of cultures and and states that maybe we don't know too much about or what we know about them has been skewed by the way british colonists wrote about them and how historians use those very uncritical sources very uncritically and regurgitated this idea that britain came in steamrolled and refashioned the world in its image Uh, that element is still there but it's within a story of yeah antagonism and resistance where violence was really at the heart of this um and so you know even the mughal empire that was you know this unfathomable military power repeatedly in eastern and western india the the East India Company do go to war with the Mughal Empire and they do try and achieve what they want, commercial monopoly, territorial jurisdictions um, at the point of a gun. And so I do I, I do then tease and bring to the fore these points of violence and military conflict um, in a way that perhaps I hadn't before and in a way we tend not to for Asia. And so then there was a more cohesive story of global resistance to British ambition tied together with, you know, still with this idea from when it was in its mirage phase that... It was the resilience and power of indigenous and non-European people, which was really the remarkable story for this period, not the inevitable success of the English or the French or the Dutch. But actually that this constellation of states and cultures so different, perhaps there's never been you know, such a diverse range of political, economic and cultural systems and structures than there was in those three centuries from the 16th to the end of the 18th century. And and the various ways in which they were able to defy British ambition and those who were caught in the crosshairs of English colonialism. That was the, that, that was the story I think that, that came through the sources the most. And I think so by placing what, you know, the story of the British in Asia and contextualizing that with what was going on elsewhere in the world, it did become more of a story of antagonism and resistance than I thought it would be. And I think that's a, I think that's a more important story. The moment, especially when there is a concerted effort for not necessarily historians, they tend to often be economists or theologians who are maybe better at occupying the public conversation about the British Empire than actual historians have been so far. And so I thought that this was an opportunity to to enter that conversation, at, you know, this absurd balance sheet approach of that these people tend to adopt that yes oh well the british empire yeah you know famine all bad but hey cricket you know so that's not bad um or ooh, think about the railways and i think if you take a longer history of the british empire because often people think you know it starts with queen victoria and there's a saturation of modern so uh history is one thing i did as i was writing is i did wander around i live in sussex in the south coast of england i wandered around quite a few bookshops just to kind of see what was what was the kind of state of histories of the british empire for a wider public audience and you know it's all 19th and 20th century not to say that's not a fantastic period to work on absolutely not but i think there's a skewed or a neglect of a much longer and richer history that that complicates this idea of the british empire as a maybe a force for good or as something that was good and bad and you know there's no railways in the 16th 17th century uh the british empire that emerges is a structure of coercion and exploitation it's a you know economically and commercially mercantilist it's about dominating resources exploiting the land displacing indigenous and non-european people it's based overwhelmingly on the enslavement of millions of people from western central africa um there's no civilizing project 
that a certain kind of person might cling on to to justify it. And so it is a far more, the early modern history of the British Empire, I think, is, serves to undermine what I think is a very flawed approach to understanding the British Empire. Was it good or was it bad? Well, empires are structures of coercion and control. And that's that's the starting point we need to take. And so inevitably, its encounter with anyone in the world was based upon assertion of authority and power. And that naturally lends itself to resistance and defiance to varying, varying degrees of success. So, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I think that a project maybe as ambitious as this, had it not changed or shifted. And I think all good, good books should change through the research process um, because yeah as i say you go in thinking you, know, you have a hypothesis but really your sources you know if you're uh, working with sources you've not worked before which you know i, I say a lot of new sources for me then they should change your ideas in your story and so it, i didn't go into this right thinking i'd be writing a story that was as violent and antagonistic as this one turned out to be so yeah so absolutely a, a big shift and i think that that title the great defiance you know, may have had some editorial assistance with that one, but I, I think it absolutely fits the wider narrative that the book ends up writing. And I think that even when I look at places like the Mediterranean or West Af- West Africa is a good example of where it, there's no, there's not necessarily resistance in the terms of indigenous people fighting the British uh, in defence of of their 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 country or their societies. The kind of defiance West African states offer the British is they defy their expectations for the trade in enslaved people. And so I, I spent a chapter writing about quite a well-known king to specialists, but not necessarily to uh, non-specialists, is uh, the kingdom of Dahomey, which is a state in West Africa that uh, goes on to conquer the, uh, the, the the ports on the coast who are some of the most important in plying the trade in enslaved Africans. And the English have managed to make themselves master of these ports and dominate the trade in enslaved people. But Dahomey defies those expectations for English monopoly by asserting its own control over the trade and by forcing British merchants to play by Dahomeyan rules. And they try and make Dahomey the the beneficiary of the slave trade, not the British merchants. Now, that's not a inspiring story of resistance. That's a terrible story. Uh, It's just that we often think of the British as becoming hegemonic and and their ambitions being realised everywhere. The story of Dahomey shows that, no, their ambitions were regularly defied and, and they were left frustrated. And because of Dahomean control of the trade in enslaved people by the mid 18th century, the Royal African Company collapses because they demand you know, so much money for sl- enslaved people and, and they demand a monopoly over certain goods. And so it's a, an example of the shifting power relationships. We always think it, it's with the Europeans. But a good example of the home, if you like, no, it is that power is often in the hands of indigenous and non-European people and that and they could defy British expectations through that. So um, it's yes, it is a story of resistance. But generally, I thought defiance was a better way to describe the frustration of British aims in the world at the time. That was a fantastic answer. So what would you say to people listening who may you, you obviously great defiance is is a lot of it is written from the perspective of of the peoples that the British and the English interacted with. And in that context, the British are usually, you know, antagonistic. How would you respond to someone who's listening to this, thinks, oh, this is a great book, this sounds fantastic, but this guy is clearly just talking Britain down. Because that is, as you're well aware, common debating point here in the UK at the moment, and it's one you're aware of. It's, a, I think, an important question i mean there is a sense to immediately dismiss it as well that's silly but i think it's become an important question i don't think it's so easily dismissed i think part of it is a disconnect and this is probably one of the main reasons i wrote this book is there's there's a real disconnect between the wonderful fruitful research and scholarship on the british empire that's been that's been done over the past uh you know 30 40 years in britain and and but also most especially in those countries that were once maybe part of the british empire but are no longer now um we see that kind of post-colonial scholarship um giving us a history of the british empire from you know people that are no longer under british rule and that obviously immediately shifted our perspective and post-colonial scholarship you know we all own a massive a debt to it and so i think but uh, and more recently with global history and attempting to take on a wider comparative picture you know all these rich themes of research that that people have been pursuing 
Now, there's a, there's a natural disconnect between, and I, and I don't think historians have been good, and I think we've got a lot to do on this score. Um, I think scientists, for example, have been great at taking their specialist research and disseminating it for a wider audience in a way which helps to bring the public conversation around science maybe maybe in better conversation with the research that's being done in universities and elsewhere. I don't think historians have been great at this. And, and as, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of that ground because of that has been occupied by people who aren't really historians and you know in a way history belongs to all of us uh you know history feeds into our identity and how we understand our place in the world and our place in relation to other cultures and people and so it owes itself naturally to a great deal of controversy and politicization and it's highly contested as every history should be history it should be highly contested of course it should be and i think that therefore naturally has led to the sort of lag between what's going on academically and what's going on in the public so, so for people not understand that the questions that this book asks and tries to answer and the kinds of questions and critical thinking that may provoke a non-specialist to say well you're just doing britain down we should be proud of our history i think that's a natural result of us not having done enough of a good job to educate people and so they see this as a new you know fad and uh, you know a, a, a part of a larger some kind of political project to do Britain down but you know this research this I, I just think the the big achievement in this book is to bring you know it is based on archival research and, and primary research mostly but I do you know I do bring a lot of the work of my colleagues and the specialists who are you know better you know far more uh, especially than I am on some of these key subjects but I've brought them under one roof and and, and hopefully create a, a kind of cohesive narrative but none of this is new really and historians have been talking about you know we, we've moved away from a british or eurocentric perspective of the world and uh, you know we've brought enslaved people and, and women um and the colonized into our narratives and histories of of the british empire for decades now none of this is new and so i, I think historians often get frustrated and dismiss the question, because it just seems so obvious that that good history does not seek to do things down or, or to do things up. Good history is is critical. And I think that those people that see critical thinking about our past as a danger or a threat. Yes, I mean, I think that, that that's, you know, that's anti-intellectual. That's that's bad faith way to approach it. But I do think that comes from a point of lack of education on this this topic. I think that we have to do a better job of taking our specialist research and educating the public about it, inaccessible histories that can be consumed, hopefully like the Great Defiance, that might provoke people to say, well, actually, I hadn't thought of it like that. And uh, that saying, yes, that, that Britain was was violent and that the people that violence was aimed at could often resist quite successfully isn't doing Britain down. It's just that's just historical scholarship. That's thinking critically about the relationship between Britain and the rest of the world. And And so I think that Partly, this is a failing of historians, and I think that more of us need to need to embrace writing for wider audiences. And I think, you know, academic scholarship should do that anyway. But I think that we almost have a obligation to wade into this this kind of contested conversation about empire. And I think that this is a great time to do it because I think, the contem you know, contemporary landscape and thinking about some of the big social issues of the day, such as, uh, you know, uh, race and legacies of imperialism and uh, these sorts of things, global inequality. I think that grappling critically with the legacies of empire and how we regard our imperial history, you know, this is begging for historians to wade in and help educate the the wider the wider audience. So, you know, a good example of a contested aspect of that is, you know, the Churchill and the reputation of Churchill. And that's become you know, certain scholars have fallen afoul of a of a wider public crowd who who will not have Churchill's name besmirched. Now, that's anti intellectual because, you know, to, to if you're really interested in a figure like Churchill, you have to understand that uh, he, he had a role in. The Second World War, for example, which if you want to view history through the lens of good and bad, you could celebrate. But you also have to place him within his longer history as uh, an actor of the the imperial project in the British Empire. And, you know, and, and the fact that part of victory in the Second World War was in preserving the British Empire and maintaining British rule over 400 million people and um, and understanding that that Winston Churchill was part of that. So I think that good history is critical and it 
disabuses us of notions of good and bad. And I do somewhat laugh at people who suggest that we should not approach this through morality and then write a book about the moral reckoning and showing to try and show how good the British Empire was. And so um, and so I, I you know, would urge my colleagues and, you know, and and I will carry on following those colleagues of mine who have waded into this and provided good scholarship that has a long history and makes it more accessible to people. Hopefully over time, you know, more people will be educated and be willing to understand that um, the British Empire, um, yeah, was this structure of control and coercion. You know, empires are not, <laughs> people don't participate in, in empires consensually. It's not, hey, do you want to join our empire and be governed by us? Um, you know, obviously that's not the case. But you know, one of the things I hope the book does is is it shows people that the British obviously were not the only ones doing it. It looks at the African role in the trade in enslaved people and the way the Kingdom of Dahomey benefited from that. It looks at uh, Spanish and Portuguese colonialism in um, in the Americas and the way the English tried to emulate that and follow from that. It looks at Portuguese colonization in the Indian Ocean and the way the English had to kind of contest and struggle against them. And so it's not, you know, it does place English... Um, imperial ambitions in that wider European context but you know I'm a historian of the British Empire and whilst I can note that other empires are engaged in this sort of thing ultimately I'm not a historian of 10 different empires and this is a book about you know it's organizing focus is is the British Empire and I don't think just because other people were engaged in this trade and enslaved people that we shouldn't talk about Britain's role um and and the fact is, you also can't have it both ways. Britain did emerge by the end of the 18th century as the dominant imperial power. And whilst others were involved in the trade in enslaved people, for example, Britain became the leading trafficker of enslaved people, three and a half million in the 18th century. Um, and so Britain often took what was already there, but but grew it on a sort of industrial scale. Colonisation, you know, the the scale of colonization english colonies was just off the charts and um and you know the scale of territorial acquisitions on the indian subcontinent no other european had achieved before so you you know in a way you, you can't accept that britain was all dominant and hegemonic and then and then suggest that it didn't do you know didn't achieve these things through violence or coercion and control so i would urge anyone who might shy away from this book not to because i like money and i want you to buy it but but also to keep an open mind that that you know, any aspect of Britain's imperial past, uh, we have to look at critically and we have to understand it critically. And I think that I don't try and remove Britain from this story. I try and integrate other really interesting aspects that might change the way we view not just the history of Britain, because history is not nationalist. It doesn't, it isn't, it doesn't stop uh, uh, borders it's the history of the early modern world in this period and while i by no means claim to look at the entire world you know there are at least a dozen countries and cultures that i look at and study and, and i like to think that this is about making a more comprehensive story about britain's imperial past and the history of, of the world before uh, uh the modern period well that is a fantastic answer to finish off on so we might as well let people know how they can get a hold of a copy of The Great Defiance, which, I, just to make it very clear, it's fantastic. Um, so where can people get it from, David? Um, thanks. Yep, all good bookshops. So, um, by uh, Penguin's uh, imprint, Ebri. You can find it online, uh, Blackwells, Foils, Amazon. Um, I think there's a promotion right now, 20% off. I think it's £20. Pounds. Uh, all good independent bookshops um, and some of the other chains, uh, Waterstones. If you're international, then Penguin India are, are printing it. But if you want to, if you're in the States, for example, then you can go through some of the... Um, uh, some of the UK shippers like Foils, who are pretty good at uh, um, exporting to to the States as well. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Vivas. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. And I hope thank to, you to Dr. Uh, David speak Vivas for speaking thank to you me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. There will be a link in the episode description to its page on Penguin. I heartily recommend it. It's really engaging. It's really well written. And if you're a long time listener, I'm convinced you'll appreciate getting another perspective on the early stages of English colonization. I really wish I'd had a copy when I was writing those episodes, but at least I'll have it to hand for the future. Remember that you can go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to get the podcast ad-free, as well as some bonus content. Thanks once again to Dr. Vivas, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>
The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy.